I'm going to read out of Proverbs. So that tells you how this Bible study is going to go tonight. Uh, Proverbs tells us one end of the spectrum. 1 Corinthians deals with the other. You know, what we found is we looked at that last week as well. And uh, Proverbs talks about wisdom. James deals with practical Christianity as well. Last week we looked at uh, being able to control your anger. James says the same thing, that every man should be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, slow to anger. Well, that's what Proverbs says too. So what we find, find is this. The Old Testament and the New Testament are consistent in their teachings all the way through. There's an Old Testament, New Testament, but there's one truth. And all of it pointing us to Jesus. Proverbs is looking at it maybe from a little different perspective than some of the other books of the Bible. But the truth in the Bible is, tr is the same from start to finish, from front to back. Most of the Bible looks at this world through the lens of right and wrong, uh, truth and error, sinful and righteous. Now Proverbs takes right and wrong and looks at it from a little different angle. It's like holding up a diamond to the light and examining all the facets of it. Proverbs looks at this, the same truth, but from a little different perspective and looks at it from the idea of, of profitable and harmful. And so that when Proverbs is giving us wisdom, it's usually telling us what will be profitable for us or what will be harmful. So the idea is this. If you do what God says, it is normally profitable for you. It's normally good for you to do what God says. Are there exceptions? Yeah, you can, you can do everything God says and something bad still happen to you. There are exceptions, sure. But this is a general truth, and the general truth is... If you do what God says, it's going to be much better for you than if you disobey God. Sin hurts. Well, tonight, I want to listen to what Proverbs says. Are you all in 1 Corinthians now? All right, so listen to what Proverbs says, and then we're going to look at 1 Corinthians. Proverbs 14, 12 says this, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now let me pray, and then... We'll look at what God has to say. Heavenly Father, thank You for this evening. Thank You for Your Word. Thank You for Your Spirit. We thank You, Lord, that we can come to You tonight and hear Your Word and that we can grow and learn and be more like Jesus and less like the old person we used to be. Help us to do that. If somebody here is lost, I pray that tonight will be the night they come to know You as Lord and Savior. Thank You for all the things You've done for us and are going to do for us. But above all things, thank You for Jesus. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. All right, so a verse like that, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, and the end thereof are the ways of death. The truth is, I could take that verse right there, and I could stand up here and rail against all the latest uh, political ills of the day, and it, everybody would amen real loud, and what I would say would be true, but that's not where we're going tonight. Uh, tonight, I want to take a look at, at uh, an eternal to truth that sort of transcends just the political uh, failings of the day. Although there are plenty of them, and we need to speak out against them. But tonight, what I'd rather do is take us and focus on Jesus. Take us to the cross. If you take people to the cross, Jesus will fix all the rest of it. And so, that's what Paul does in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Hey, it's really, it's the same truth. It's sort of the other side of the coin. The same truth as what Proverbs is talking about. Proverbs is talking about a person who is doing what is right in their own mind. Whereas, Paul in 1 Corinthians dealing with wisdom, just like Proverbs is, Paul takes the other side and says that those who follow God have a very different understanding of wisdom and knowledge than those who follow their own way. He says this in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. He says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. You ever, uh, you ever seen somebody come to faith in Christ and you could see a real difference in their life? Now, some of you came to faith in Christ when you were very young. And I did that. I came to faith 
in Christ when I was very young. And so the transformation in my life outwardly was not radical. People couldn't see maybe outwardly the change. But I'm going to tell you something. Inwardly, the change was just as radical in me as it was from a drunk who was 50 years old and a drunk and got saved in Jesus Christ and his life was radically changed. When I got saved, I went from being a person who was lost and an enemy of God to becoming a child of God, an heir of a king, and having new eternal spiritual life. The change in me was radical internally. You may not have seen it externally as visibly as you could maybe somebody else, but the change was just as radical in me as it was anybody else who ever got saved. Sometimes you see that in somebody who is a little older, and you can see that transformation visibly. You can see that happen. I, I remember when Glenn came to Christ, I pastored First Baptist of Tracy City, and Daryl Street invited Glenn to come to church with him, and Glenn said, all right, I'll go. That was, that was how he talked. I mean, really, I'm not really exaggerating that. All right, I'll go. He called him. Come pick me up Sunday, I'll go to church with you. And he came for several months. And he never, never came to faith in Christ. Came Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, every week. And every week I thought, this is the Sunday that Glenn's going to get saved. So finally I went to his house. I said, Glenn, I want to come over and talk to you about the Lord and see if you didn't want to get saved. And Glenn said, well, I might as well. <laughs> so that's his response. And he prayed and he received Christ. And people from the community would talk to me about Glenn. They would... People who didn't know the Lord and didn't go to church would talk to me and they would say, you know, ever since he started coming to old church over there, he's different. He smiles. He don't even cuss anymore. <laughs> and uh, you could see, Glenn was 80 years old when he came to faith in Christ. And you could see in his life a very radical, obvious transformation. But I'm going to tell you something. Anybody that comes to faith in Christ, whether they're young or old, whether boy or girl, rich or poor, black or white, anybody who comes to faith in Christ undergoes a radical transformation in their life. And that ought to make you very different from those who don't know Jesus. A saved life makes no sense to people who aren't saved. That's what Paul is telling us here. He says the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after then the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Paul tells us that the preaching of the cross to those people who don't know Jesus Christ. In Paul's day, the preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection was to those people foolishness. They don't understand it. Now when I say they don't understand it, I don't mean they don't understand the words coming out of your mouth. They may understand when you say He was crucified, they may know what that means. And you say that He died and rose again, people may understand that concept. But spiritually speaking, placing your faith and trust in that truth makes no sense to them whatsoever. They don't understand why a person would believe that, and why a person would follow that. And so what we see here in this passage, what we see is this. It is a, a confluence. You know, a confluence, they use that, that to describe maybe where two rivers run together, you know, where the Tennessee River would run into the Mississippi River or whatever river it runs into. I can't remember now. But anyway, where two big rivers would run together Missouri and the Mississippi and the confluence of those rivers. Here is a, a confluence. It, it is the confluence of this objective truth and subjective transformation. Now let me tell you what I mean. Everybody, you still with me here? Let me tell you what I mean. Jesus saves. Right? And Jesus saves whether you believe in Jesus or not. It is true whether you believe it's true or not, Jesus died for your sins. 
He was buried and He rose from the dead, victorious over sin, death, hell, and the grave. That is a statement of fact. It is true. And it's true whether you believe it or not, whether you receive that, whether you accept it, it is true. But, when you receive that truth, accept it, and surrender your life to that truth, it has now become a subjective transformation. That objective truth that Jesus saves, now it's not just a truth hanging out there in the stratosphere somewhere. Now, it has become personal to you. You have been saved and received Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life, and now you know what that means. The Bible gives us the opposite example of that in a very clear way. Adam and Eve did not know what sin was until they ate of the fruit, and then they did. Unfortunately. But when you receive Jesus Christ, what Paul calls in Romans the second Adam, when you receive Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven, and now you know what it's like to be saved. Jesus saves, but now you know what it's like to be saved because Jesus saved you. And so there's the objective truth of Christ and the subjective truth of being saved by Jesus Christ. Listen, the truth of the Bible is not just a a cerebral set of facts. It's also something that should transform our lives and we should live out every day. And Paul is talking about this here. He's saying that those people hear these truths, they see them lived out, and they're unwilling to accept those truths and to live them out in their everyday lives. It makes no sense to them. They may understand the words coming out of your mouth, but they don't understand the subjective transformation that takes place when a person receives Jesus Christ. They have never been saved, never experienced the change that comes from knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. A saved life makes no sense to somebody who isn't saved. They see it, but they don't understand it. Can't comprehend it. Can't figure out exactly what's going on. Well, that's what Paul is dealing with here. And and then he says this. He says, a simple life makes no sense. Verse 26, for you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are, are called. A simple life. Now, by that I don't mean, I, I really mean a scriptural life. Living by the simple truths of God's Word. That doesn't make any sense to an unbeliever. By simple, I don't mean that all of us have to become homesteaders and we have to start slaughtering our own beef and churning our own butter. That's not what I mean when I say a simple life. I mean living by the simple truths that the Bible teaches us. There are a lot of people that are very conservative in life, but they don't live by the truths of the Bible. You can be conservative and not be saved. You can be conservative and not be biblical. You can be conservative and still be very, very different from a Christian. By the way, if you are very, very liberal, you're nothing like a Christian. <laughs> but you can be very conservative in your life and still be nothing like a believer. A Christian doesn't have to live like a homesteader. That's not what I mean. I mean they are patterning their life after the truths found in God's Word. They read God's Word, they study it, they learn it, and they try to live that out in their everyday life. Their belief system comes from the truths of Scripture, not by what they hear on the TV or the radio or read off the internet somewhere. By the way, you can hear good sermons on the radio. You can get good sermons on the internet, right Terry? You can hear hear good sermons on Facebook and YouTube. You can get this sermon tonight on Facebook and YouTube, but there's an awful lot of things that we don't want to live our life by. Here's what John says about it. Remember, the old the Proverbs and the New Testament really parallel each other. John says this, 1 John 2.15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So there is a way that seems right unto man, but the end of it is death, the ways of death. You and I can think we're doing the right thing and be doing it completely wrong. <clears throat> 
even as believers, sometimes we can fall into that trap. Even as believers. I am convinced Southern Baptists are some, we're a very conservative denomination. We fit into a group of believers that call themselves evangelicals. And that word doesn't have a real clear definition. That can be a, mean a lot of things depending on who's using that word. But at one point at least, it meant something. It, that was the Billy Graham kind of Christianity, an evangelical. It was a person who shared their faith, took the Bible seriously, but tried to engage the world in doing so. And that separated us from fundamentalists who had their own schools and uh, had, you know, they, they uh, homeschooled their kids or had their own school at church and they didn't go to movies and they didn't go to entertainment, wouldn't go to football games. And they, you know, that, that sort of, now where is the line between that? I don't know. There's not a real good line on that stuff. How do you distinguish between the two? I don't know. Those are just titles. Those are just, um, those are definitions that, ever, that always change. But uh, we fit somewhere in that range. Evangelical. A person who shares their faith, lives out Jesus Christ, but tries to engage the world in doing so. And there has always been a danger. Always been a danger for us to think that if we talk like the world and act like the world, the world will think we're cool and they'll know Jesus. Y'all, y'all still listening, aren't you? God does not use worldly things to win the world to Christ. It doesn't work. You don't win people to Christ by being cooler than worldly people and more appealing than worldly things. You know what brings people to Jesus? Jesus does. You share the good news that Jesus saves. He died for your sins. He rose from the dead. He will save you if you will ask Him. He will change you if you will let Him. That truth brings people to Christ and nothing else will. And if they don't come to that, they won't understand any of the rest of it either. Jesus makes no sense until you know Him. He says, not many... You see, notice your calling. How many, not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. You know what God doesn't do? God doesn't save the smartest person in every generation, the richest person in every generation, and the most powerful person in every generation, and then use all those people to win people to Christ. That's not how God normally operates. Can a rich person be saved? Yes. Or a smart person? Yes. Or a powerful person? Yes. And it's happened before, and it'll happen again, but that's not what God uses to win people to Christ. Not normally. Adrian Rogers told this story. He was pastor in a church in Florida. And he had a big evangelistic meeting. And they had the world's strongest man who shared his testimony. And the boy came to church a few days after that uh, event, and he said he wanted to come to faith in Christ. He said, it was that testimony of that, that guy the other night. I heard that and I want to know Jesus. And he said, oh yes, in the way only Adrian Rogers can. I wish I had that voice. Oh yes, the world's strongest man, yes. And he said, uh, the world's strongest man. You heard him give his testimony and you came to faith because of the world's strongest man. And the young boy that came to him said, who? And he said, the world's strongest man. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I guess he was okay. He said, no, I was talking about that guy in the wheelchair. And Adrian Rogers said he had forgotten about this other fellow altogether. But a man in a wheelchair had gotten up and shared his testimony of faith in Jesus Christ. And that young guy said, I looked up there and I saw that guy in that wheelchair. And I saw the difference that Jesus had made in his life. And I thought, man, if Jesus can make that much difference in a guy like that, I need Jesus. It wasn't the world's strongest man that won him to Christ. It was the world's weakest man. The world's weakest man. Hmm. Verse 25 says this, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You know what happens 
when you forget about all the worldly things and you point people to something otherworldly, extra-worldly, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. You know what happens? You and I don't get the glory. The world doesn't get the glory. God gets the glory. He says that, verse 29 says this, that no flesh should glory in His presence, but of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You know why God saves people through Jesus Christ? Not the, the world's most glamorous thing. No, no, His Son who was crucified on a cross. God doesn't use the big things of the world to save people. He uses the small things so that He gets the glory. The world doesn't deserve glory, but God does. Galatians 2.20, Paul says this, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. How about you? If, when people look at your life, are you trying to point them to Jesus? That's really the only thing that matters. Well, we'll stop there tonight. Instead of talking about decisions that lead to death we really looked at the other side decisions that lead to life and that's jesus christ any comments any questions or anything this evening